Hi everyone, welcome this week. I have a very special guest that I am super excited to be introducing. Her name is Maria Emmerich. She is a ketogenic nutritionist who has helped thousands and thousands of people. I've learned a lot from her just following her over the years. Um, she's written so many cookbooks, I don't know, like 16, 17, maybe more, um, you know, national best-selling author, amazing person. I'm super excited to have her on. We're going to go over some great topics today and uh, give you some really valuable information. Hi, Maria. Hey, how's it going? Very good. You? Thank you for being here. Oh, it's awesome. Thank you for asking me to be on. It's an honor. Oh, yes. Our, our pleasure. So I wanted to talk to you today about some specific things regarding all your information with the ketogenic diet. And you have such a following and such a large wealth of information. I know we could cover so many topics, but I kind of wanted to start with your journey and a little bit about who you are for those who may not know you. Oh, of course. Um, well, gosh, over 25 years ago, I was not feeling well. And I went to my family doctor. I was 16 years old. You can do the math if you want to. Um, <laughs> but I went to my family doctor and I was told I had something called PCOS, which we now know is a type a form of type 2 diabetes. Um, I had depression, so she gave me an antidepressant. Um, I had IBS, acid reflux. N needless to say, I left that doctor's visit with not only a diagnosis that I couldn't have my own children, most likely, I also was given three very powerful drugs for a young teenager. Wow. And as fate had it, I took my dog, who was a beautiful golden retriever, to the vet that same week. Um, and she was losing patches of her hair. And the first question the vet asked me was, what are you feeding her? And on the flip side, my doctor said it was nothing I was doing wrong. It was just the cards I was dealt in life. But if she would have asked, I worked at a coffee shop. So before school, I would go to the coffee shop and I would make the scones and the muffins and the cinnamon rolls. And then I would go to school. And then after high school, when school is done, I would go back to the coffee shop and we would close about 530 and whatever didn't sell, I got to go home with because nobody wants a leftover cinnamon roll, right? So I was making extra cinnamon rolls because I just love them so much. So I was living off of mochas and cinnamon rolls and all this. And there wasn't the internet back then. But when you look into what causes PCOS, it's excess carbohydrates, sugar, and uh, caffeine. <laughs> So I was living off of those things. So I really had to take a deep dive into my diet. And I'm a foodie. I like food. I don't want to live off of chicken breast and broccoli. And so I just started recreating like cinnamon rolls and made them. I have a protein sparing cinnamon roll now, but I just made my favorite food into something I could live off of. And I was just eating that way. And people thought I was weird, but I was like, I don't care. Like I'm just a stubborn German girl. And here I am 25 years ago, and everybody wants to know my secrets. <laughs> nice. Yeah, awesome. And they still do. <laughs> so, okay, great. Well, that's a really inspiring story. And all you've done with that to help the world has been really incredible. I wanted to ask you specifically, uh, for someone who wants to use keto for the purposes of changing their body composition, losing body fat, gaining muscle mass, what is your recommendation in, in starting that type of journey? Um, just, I guess, if you're like totally overwhelmed, I would say just cut the sugar out. You know, that's step number one is cut the <laughs> sugar out. Step number two, I would say, is cut the seed oils out, like the canola, cotton seed oil. You know, look at your salad dressings, your mayos, all of that. Because I do think sugar and the seed oils are the two biggest contributor to our bodies not working the way they want to. Um, so I think that's like the biggest steps. I think the biggest misconception is we're already eating a high fat diet, hmm. but we're just really high carbohydrate too. I would say, let's just okay. like cut the carbohydrates out. We don't need to add more fat because you're probably already at your personal fat threshold. If I you're see. overweight, if you have type two diabetes, if you have insulin resistance, you're already at your personal fat threshold. So don't be adding more fat to the diet. So that's just where 
I differ from a lot of so-called experts that are kind of new to the scene. There's a lot of new keto doctors that are all over YouTube and they're like, put a stick of butter in your coffee. I'm like, well, first of all, coffee is a bad idea. And then right. put a stick of butter in there. Like, what do you think that does? So that's just kind of like the nonsense I'm fighting against. But at the same time, all of their clients come to me and like, help, I ended up gaining weight. I'm like, of course you did. And then we end up fixing them and it's all good. <laughs> nice, nice. Okay, yeah. I, I have heard that quite a bit about increasing your fat intake to start a ketogenic diet, but that hasn't been your experience as something that is needed. It's just lowering the carbs. No, uh, some people may say, you know, have like fat bombs or something to get the sugar cravings away. Sure. But I like to use other techniques because you know, if you're already working with somebody who's very metabolically damaged, who has yeah. insulin resistance, adding more fat on top of that is not going to help insulin resistance. Hmm. So okay. different techniques work better. Okay, gotcha. And then I know that you've mentioned, and this is something that not everyone does in the, in the keto space, uh, don't count net carbs. Like that's not the way to go about it either. No, I mean, I work with type one diabetics and also type two, but knowing that the whole like fiber, like people would subtract fiber and they're like, right. you know, um, these, this bread is only like one net carb. I think at Subway, they have a zero net carb bread now. But if you look at the total carbohydrates and if you look at what it's going to do to your blood sugar, it's going to spike it probably more than what you, when you ate a Kit Kat bar or a Snickers bar, because the Kit Kat or the Snickers has fat to help lower that uh, blood sugar spike. But if you just have a bunch of, um, you know, fiber, it's going to affect blood sugar and it's going to affect your outcome and your desirable goals. And I know how when people come to me, they want it bad. Like they're searching for answers, right? They've tried everything else. And I'm like, OK, if you do X, Y and Z, you know, like I'm known as being very strict. But guess what? It works really great. You know, you do what I tell you. And a lot of people are like, yeah, I'm just going to do whatever you tell me to do. And part of it is like counting the total carbohydrates. That's huge. And staying underneath 20 grams is very, it's helpful. You know, 99% of people that come to me want it for weight loss. Right. Yeah, and same here. in that case, yeah, I mean, I'm going to say stay under 20. But also like if you have epilepsy or seizures, I'm going to probably say that too. Okay. Gotcha. So um, just to be very clear for those who are listening, when you're saying a low carb diet, it's any carbohydrate, even if the packaging says two net carbs, look at the back and it should be like, what are the total, the total carbs might be, I've seen them be 20 or 30. And that's the, the 20 grams of carbohydrates you're talking about staying below. If you're grabbing a packaged item that says keto on it, I would say throw it in the garbage because it's probably crap. Nice, nice. Because, you know, keto got really popular maybe like five years ago and, you know, Slim Fast jumped on board. Um, Duncan Hines is now making a keto brownie and cake and all of that stuff is junk. I would not touch it. I would not recommend to touch it. So um, if you're if you're looking at a package, it's probably something I wouldn't eat anyway. I mean, I don't know. The packaged items have an eggshell for me. I don't know. <laughs> totally understood. Yes. Yeah, and totally agreed. And, and so if somebody's looking at their app and they've entered in their carbs and their food for the day, their total carb count, not net, would need to be 20 or below to really start dialing in. I mean, it depends on how much muscle mass you have. It depends on how active you are. It depends on what your goals are, too. So like when I was saying, you know, dialing the fat down, if you have MS or Alzheimer's, epilepsy, you know, I'd probably get a up increase of fat, you know, so it's not, I'm sure. just saying 99% of people jump on the keto bandwagon to lose weight. Um, right. But uh, back to your point, what were you saying? <laughs> Sorry. Those oh, yeah. carbs or total carbs need to be low. Yeah. And it's, yeah. it's hard. I mean, eggs have a carbohydrate scallops, like a lot of seafood has some right. carbohydrates. Don't fear them. Okay. Um, you know, those are the ones that, you know, I would say are not a big deal, but when it comes right. to like 
um, psyllium husk and flaxseed, those are all, they come with bad side effects, including like flax is very estrogenic. I feel that we're going to find out the same, what we know about soy products that is very mm -hmm. estrogenic. Yeah. It's just taking us time. You know, I've known it for a decade that flax is not something that you want to consume. It's not even good for your intestines. So just don't, don't, a lot of keto recipes may have it, but just run away from that. Okay. Good to know. Yeah. Um, okay, great. And then um, how about using fasting in the mix here, like intermittent fasting when somebody's specifically working on um, body composition, losing body fat? Um, I am not a fan of extended fasting. You will okay. lose muscle mass. So when I say fasting, I'm only talking about intermittent fasting. And that's just closing the window. And it sounds kind of extreme when you first start thinking about it, but it's really not. You're mm -hmm. just closing the window. So if you're not hungry when you wake up, that's a good sign. That means that, you know, your blood sugars are getting more balanced. So waiting until you're hungry, like I'm up working usually like at 4.30 in the morning, even on a Saturday or Sunday. Um, and I'll probably eat about 9.30 or 10. And then not eating right before bed also, because it's, it's all about hormone manipulation. And you can really manipulate your hormones with the timing of when you eat and stuff. So not eating like three hours before bed helps with this. It's called a human growth hormone that helps with fat burning while you sleep, but right. it's antagonist is insulin. And even if you ate pure fat, insulin will rise some. So just kind of shortening the window, but it's very usually natural. When I say, you know, intermittent fasting, that means, you know, like butter coffee. Cause that's another thing I get people. Oh, I don't eat until like one. They're like, so you didn't have any like bulletproof coffee? They're like, oh yeah, I had that. I was like, you just had 500 calories of pure fat. Like you're not fasting. Don't be okay. fooled. Wow. Okay. So, um, that's where just shortening the window. Don't be eating every two to three hours, you know. Okay. Right. I wanted to bring that up, the bulletproof coffee, because that has really, um, you know, come onto the scene strongly in the ketogenic circles for, for a lot of people. I get asked about it all the time. So um, when a person does a bulletproof coffee or maybe they're not doing caffeine, I've, I've been asked that too, like a bulletproof style herbal tea that they like or something in the morning, that's in, that kicks you out of your fasting and is inhibiting to the body fat loss game, huh? Well, that too, there's no nutrients. If you look at how much nutrients are in that cup of fat, there's yeah. more nutrients in sugar. So instead of drinking your calories, sit down and have some steak and eggs to break your fast. Because if so, we're looking at calorie for calorie, you're going to get so many more nutrients if you actually eat protein and you're going to keep your beautiful hair. That's the thing too. A lot of people do that and they do like these fat fasts or fat, uh, fat bombs and yeah. egg fasts. They end up losing their hair. Their thyroid has issues and it's because they're not getting their protein in. And when you drink your calories, it doesn't signal these uh, hormones in your brain to tell you that you're full and satisfied. Chewing is very powerful. You know, mm. chewing is registers all these hormones of satisfaction. So I would say like, if you make a rule, you don't drink any calories. You only chew calories. Wow. Okay, cool. Good to know. Um, okay, great. This is great information. Um, and then another question for you, a lot of people that I work with, they start out and we get them into ketosis. You, we're using something to measure it, like, you know, like a device, keto mojo or whatever. And at some point they, you know, we run into the situation where the ketones aren't showing up as much, but they're still getting the body composition gains. What do you have to say about that? Um, I would say, well, you know, follow your goals, like don't chase, chase results, don't chase the numbers. Okay. However, if you're using urine strips to test, they're not going to work after a few weeks because they only tell you if you're hydrated or not. And they're not testing beta hydroxybutyrate. Right. But another thing is the longer you've been keto, 25 years, my ketones are going to be extremely low. And also I run before I eat anything. Mm -hmm. So by the time I'm done running, I'm showing extremely low ketones. Do I get nervous that they're not at this 
optimal fat burning ketone number? No, because that's a load of crap. Okay. Um, I've used all my ketones for my running. I don't have any left. I see. And your body becomes more efficient. Your mitochondria becomes more efficient at making ketones. So your numbers are going to be much lower. So it just means that your liver's efficient at making free fatty acids. Like you don't have to stress out about the number chase results. Nice. I love it. Chase results. You know, yes. You know, you can add. So let's say we had a bowl of rice. You yeah. put a bunch of MCT oil on it. You're going to see higher ketones. Does it mean that you're going to lose weight? Nope. You're going to gain it because fat plus the carbohydrates cause weight gain. So okay. you may be reading high ketones just because you put MCT oil on, you know, a bunch of kabocha squash or something like that. It just means that you're, you, you know, you just have a bunch of fat in your bloodstream. It doesn't mean that you're burning fat. Right. Makes sense. Makes sense. So what's your take? Does MCT oil contribute to the journey of losing body fat with keto? No, I think it's empty calories and it's such a processed oil that right. it's nothing that I've ever touched and I've lost half my body weight and I don't actually recommend it. It often causes some upset stomach, nausea, um, sometimes diarrhea. I mean, yep. there's this theory that it makes your mitochondria more efficient or something like that. Yeah. I find that, is it worth the risk of that processed oil? I don't think so. Right. Makes sense. Wow. Okay, good. And then something that we've used a lot, thank you, is your uh, protein sparing modified fasting with great results. And um, I just wanted to get a little bit more about how that came about and, and how you recommend to use it. Well, um, when I wrote my first book, I wrote about my pure protein days. And my pure protein days were protein sparing days, but I, that's not a term that I ever came up with. It's, you know, a term that's someone else did, mm. but I just called my neck, you know, the protein very modified fast book that because that's what people are searching, but I call them my pure protein days. And what that meant was my carbohydrates were always low, but I dialed the fat down even lower. So it's going to be like 20, 30 grams of fat, it's just enough for hormones, just enough for absorption of AD. E and K vitamins, um, but it's lowering the fat. Um, and, but then I focus on high protein. So lean proteins like, you know, any fish, even salmon is a pretty protein sparing fish, seafood. Um, I always eat a tenderloin steak like every day after my run, um, but choosing the leaner cuts. And so I have charts in the book, protein sparing meats are over here the higher fat meats like short ribs are down there because they don't have a lot of protein, but they do have a lot of fat. Right. Um, but it's a really wonderful tool for, so say you fell off the wagon for Halloween. This is a great way to just dive right back in, lose the five pounds you gained or whatever. Um, but it's also a very efficient way to reverse insulin resistance because you're going to shrink the fat cells while you maintain the muscle. That's the biggest difference. So people think I'm pretty extreme by doing this protein sparing days, but it's the same people saying I'm extreme, say don't eat anything every other day. You know, like right. to me, the studies are out there. They show that you do lean, lose lean mass when you do, only do a water fast. So protein sparing is you keep your muscle mass, you burn the body fat. That's what everybody wants to do. And yeah. I, like I told you, I love good food. So I'm really great at making, I have an ice cream recipe. That's all protein. I have, you know, um, Danishes, cinnamon rolls that are all protein. Even the frosting is made with egg whites. They're really good. So like, I don't know. I think it's okay to enjoy the food you're eating mm -hmm. as long as eating doesn't become your life. So I think that there's a hard balance to find, but a lot of people come to me with past eating disorder saying, I'm finally free of always thinking about food. And that's really what warms my heart. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I can vouch, I've tried your uh, protein sparing um, bread and yeah. it is very amazing. It's unexpected how good it is, you know. Isn't that weird? Yeah, you, I, I, I don't know. For me, I went in with a little bit of like, okay, yeah, egg whites, come on. But uh, 
but yeah, I got hooked and now I have like all these tab things for your book here. <laughs> oh, that's so nice. Thank yeah. You. That's the thing. Like I wrote that recipe like 16 years ago and now like nobody even tried it back then. And now that is popular, everybody claims it as their recipe. I'm like, oh, come on. It took me so long to write that recipe, you know, but um, no, I'm going to have to send you some books to do giveaways on your Instagram or something. <laughs> You're so yeah, sweet. absolutely. Well, all our clients, all the people I work with and we work with at the practice here, hear your name at some point in their, you know, if they're working on body composition, especially and using that. And the other one that's really popular is the, which you wouldn't think is the um, egg pudding, the, the mm -hmm. protein egg pudding, the chocolate. Yep. So again, I was skeptical, but it's really good. So talking about skeptics, um, I made that recipe for Halle Berry and oh. she's like, Maria, I am not eating a uh, pudding made from eggs. She's like, no, 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 no. She yeah. was like so adamant about it. And when she finally tried it, she's like, this is the best chocolate mousse I've ever had. And it's a really cool story. Like when we first adopted the boys, my husband lost his job, but we didn't have any money. And what's the cheapest keto food? Eggs. eggs. Yeah. My littlest one hated eggs. He hated scrambled eggs, deviled eggs, you name it. He did not like eggs. And I was like, how am I going to make something that this kid would eat? And I had a bunch of hard boiled eggs in the fridge. So I threw them into a blender with a can of coconut milk and some cocoa powder, some natural sweetener, a little bit of cinnamon and vanilla and blended that up. And it's amazing. But I will say if you use scrambled eggs, you won't get that sulfur um, smell that sometimes takes over the taste. So uh -huh. I think that using scrambled eggs makes it even better. Okay. I'll keep that in mind. I'll yeah. pass that along. Thanks. <laughs> Um, okay, great. Yeah. Yeah. And all the recipes, you know, I've, some of them are a little daunting for me. I'm not super culinary, but I'm learning to be more and more And my clients are too. And the people we work with at the practice. So thank you so much for that. Um, another thing I wanted to ask you about is a lot of times, um, we have people doing really well with keto and then they're losing body fat and they're feeling better, all these things. And then they hit kind of a slump or a plateau, whatever you want to call it. Do you have some best practices for, for helping someone break through that? Um, yeah. I mean, there's different reasons that it could happen. Coffee would be one of them, but I look at, you know, there's like a bunch of different steps on how to take it. But I would say like, are you still doing coffee? You take that away. I don't doubt you're going to lose five pounds in that next month because it always happens. And, you know, coffee does affect blood sugar, which is why it takes your hunger away. And it's probably right. the hardest thing that was for me to cut out, um, but also like dairy. And that's why my books are dairy free. I live in Wisconsin. Like we love our cheese. You can buy cheese curds at the gas station. Sure. And that's why like cutting that out for a period of time, if not forever, is very, very helpful for weight loss. And that's why the books focus on that. And also nuts, you know, cause nuts are the fat plus carbohydrates. So when I make cinnamon rolls, I don't use almond flour. I don't use coconut flour, you know, like in the bread, that's why, you know, you're getting away from the almond flours and coconut flours and that type of stuff, mm -hmm. which is in, a lot of keto recipes. I've used them too. Um, I also, you know, I have children and that type of stuff, but if it comes for weight loss, I would say try to cut the nuts and the dairy and the coffee, but then there's also like a whole nother step of other things other than food that can help, but those are the food ones. Right. Understood. And we find a, a common culprit and things that something that people don't think with are uh, unhealthy vegetable oils. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. yeah. I mean, and those, those, um, and everybody's like, well, what about avocado oil or olive oil? It's like, well, those are fruits. Um, they're different, but you know, the more natural fats would be like, um, beef tallow and leaf lard and duck fat and bacon fat, like mm -hmm. trying to use those more animal fats. Um, but those seed oils, like they're found in just about every mayo out there, except for a few, um, uh, salad dressings. Um, I've even seen it in frozen salmon. I don't know why, but there's yeah. frozen salmon. It's in the coffee mate, even though it says zero hydrogenated oils. If you look on the back, it's just a small enough serving size that they don't have to list it 
you know, it's, it can say it's, you know, wow. and they say it's sugar free too. And if you look at the back, it's uh, fructose corn syrup. It's just what they can do with marketing is really crazy. I did a whole blog post about where seed oils are hidden, but even like you go to a restaurant and you order an omelet or like I speak on the cruise sometimes, um, or um, you should come to Italy with me. I do this like Italy I'd trip. <laughs> yeah, no, right? We talk, we have like a keto Italy trip, which is awesome. There's no judging. So if you don't want to, if you want to eat pasta, I don't care, but I want to teach you what I know. Mm -hmm. um, but like if you ha order breakfast, if you order eggs, they're going to cook them in like, you know, vegetable oil. Yeah. So I always say, here's some butter. Will you cook my eggs? And, you know, there's usually like a little pad of butter. Like, could you cook them in this, please? And they're like, sure. You know, are you French? I'm like, no, but I just like good food. It tastes way better anyway. But yeah, it's hidden in a lot of things for sure. Nice. Okay. Yeah. And we've found that when you omit that, sometimes that helps with breaking through yes. uh, a plateau as well. Absolutely. So, okay, great. And then another thing that's come up a lot with um, as a question is, you know, when you get into doing a very low carb diet, you sometimes lose a lot of fiber. People, people who have a tendency to be, to be constipated, uh, bring this up often or experience it and then have questions on what are your thoughts on that? Um, I have carnivores in my family right now and you do not need fiber to go number two. If you think about, think about this newborn babies, they poo all the time and they don't eat any fiber. Sure. Okay. What happens is fiber is like steel wool on your intestines and it's not a good thing. I work with a lot of people with diverticulitis, Crohn's or colitis and getting them off medication. And it's not because like fiber is not a good thing. I would say, I would say it's the opposite of a good thing. If you get constipated on the ketogenic diet, you know what your colon does need salt. Mm. It needs a lot of salt because when you eliminate all the carbohydrates along goes all this water loss. And with all this water loss goes all this hydration and your colon needs that hydration. So how can you add that in without adding carbohydrates? Salt. Salt is great for your energy, your bone health. Like, I don't know where this thought came from. Salt is bad for your bones. I've heard that. And I was like, what? If you look at the science, it's absolutely untrue. Um, but salt, you need more salt. Also, dairy is constipating. Nuts are constipating. Right. Um, so I would say get your, you know, cut out the dairy and the nuts and add more salt. Nice, nice. Yeah, that resonates so well. Um, because I've had actually quite a few clients recently, I, I, it seems to go in cycles with a situation like diverticulitis. And when we added fiber in, it exacerbated the situation. So we, we went for a lower fiber, higher liquid uh, content in their diet, but I'm going to try that salt bit as well. So yeah, lots yeah. Of salt. that's where electrolytes come into play. Yep. Right. Awesome. Um, okay, great. And then as people get into ketosis, they start achieving their body composition goals. A lot of time this morphs into wanting to put on muscle mass and wanting to increase their bone density. Um, how can the ketogenic lifestyle be used to help with that? Well, that's where like my whole practice is more of a higher protein approach to the ketogenic diet. I have a free macro calculator on my website. Yeah, I've used it. Maria Thank you. It's, <laughs> yeah. it's totally free. For, I mean, we spent a lot of money. Like, I can't tell you how much it costs to create this calculator, but it's very oh. helpful for people. Yeah. And it just tells you what your macro should be. Like, what are your goals? If you change it from weight loss to muscle gain, it's going to give you a different macro breakdown. Um, if you want to uh, build bone, the most important everybody should want to build bone. The most important way to stop bone loss or osteopenia, osteoporosis, protein, protein, vitamin K2, cutting out the, uh, the coffee is important. Um, you know, cutting out the sugar, but protein is like step number one for building the sheath of your bones. It's mineralized protein. So that's probably the most, that was, um, we have assignments for my coaches and that was one of the latest ones was this huge study showing, the best way to reverse bone loss is to uh, put them on a high protein diet. Perfect. Yeah. Makes a lot of sense. That's what your body uses to build itself up. Um, okay. And then you mentioned something about uh, keto carnivore. You have, uh, you work with some people on that and I've seen some of your information on that. That's not something I've done a lot with, 
how does that fit into the regular keto? I was carnivore for a while. Um, I wrote a carnivore cookbook with my husband. Mm -hmm. um, the reason why he went carnivore was because of some, uh, he has Lyme disease and it's just kind of, it took away the pain. So when he eliminated, so in the book, we expand on it, but all plants have anti-nutrients. Right. So do I eat some plants? Yes, I do. But I pick ones that don't have oxalates and that type of thing that are mineral depleters. They, they bind to things like calcium and they can build up and cause kidney stones and that type of stuff. But carnivore is very um, healing. So when I, it's like the ultimate autoimmune protocol. So when I work with someone with a lot of food allergies or autoimmune issues going on, um, histamine issues, it's, you know, the carnivore diet heals. It really, really does. Especially right. with like the diverticulitis and stuff. Yeah, I actually have someone I work with who is diverticulitis and SIBO. And uh, the carnivore diet was the only thing that uh, gave some alleviation and then seemed to move things towards a healing process. Right. And nothing yeah. is like if you deal live. I worked at um, I volunteered at a, a nursing home when I was in high school. And I remember asking my favorite patient at the nursing home, what's the secret to a happy life? And he said, take care of your back. And I was like, is that a metaphor for something? And he said, no, if you live in chronic pain, you can't focus on anything good in your life. Sure. And I believe that's why people, I mean, for me, carnivore was like, I was looking because if you're a true carnivore, there's no onions, there's no garlic, there's no seasoning besides salt. There's no pepper there's no you know onion powder none of that mm -hmm. so you know i'm a foodie like i said but if you are living in chronic pain like my husband craig there's nothing he's like there's nothing that tastes good is how i feel like he's like but I, you know i'm a master in the kitchen i do know how to make really good carnivore food which we mm -hmm. did i did do that for a very long period of time while i was writing the book mm -hmm. and i wanted to support him in his journey um but there just came a point where like food just wasn't even of interest to me. I probably lost too much weight. Um, and so I ended up adding in things too. Understood. Understood. One thing that um, we often talk to people about is the value of herbs, their nutrient density, and how they can be used to enhance um, absorption of foods and whatnot. What, what is your take on how that fits in here? Um, I will say it depends. Um, herbs are on that plant field and, you know, I can send you the carnivore book. You can't deny like these anti-nutrients that they're, it's their defense mechanism mechanism. Right. So do I, there's some herbs that I definitely have taken, um, uh, for health reasons, but I think it would just depend on what your situation is. You know, it's kind of like not all box you know it doesn't fit everybody's category of course of course yeah no that makes sense absolutely and then um you, just to out of curiosity because i like to run i wouldn't call myself like a, a super athlete it's more of a something i enjoy but you mentioned that you um use running as a form of exercise and that you fit this into your lifestyle i've noticed some people seem to feel like their athletic performance goes down a bit when they do keto um, are there any hacks to make sure you stay uh, where you want to be if you're like an avid runner? Yeah, I would say look into Zach Bitter. Zach Bitter is the ultra marathoner that is the world record holder uh, for all these different races. And he is keto. And uh -huh. I would say don't switch to keto if you're signed up for a marathon next week. <laughs> but if you're signed up for a marathon next year, you're most likely going to hit kill it even better because have you run a marathon? Yes. A couple of times. Okay. Um, Do you know mile 20? They have the wall, yeah, right? Yeah. The reason that it's at mile 20 is because after 20 miles, the body that is using glucose for fuel hits a wall and you run the last six miles out of pure adrenaline. Wow. However, if you are keto, you have infinite nights to burn your fat for fuel. Right. Okay. But, and this is why a lot of men's men are more likely to walk at that point where women can usually run through because they can switch from using glucose to fat easier than men can. Really? 
Mm -hmm. I didn't but know that. it's just um, electrolytes are important. A lot of electrolytes. Most people do not do enough. Uh, and that's salt. You cannot absorb salt if you, or you cannot absorb magnesium and potassium if you don't get enough salt. Mm -hmm. So that's where the, you know, the sodium is huge when it comes to that. And most people, I don't salt my food enough. I don't like it. And so, and I don't like salty water. There's a lot of drinks that, you know, you put salt in your water, or whatever. Mm -hmm. So I take, um, there's certain, uh, capsules that I just do because it's just easier. I take them in the morning and then also taking them at bedtime for sleep is good too. Oh, nice. Do you have a, a favorite product that you like to use or? Yeah. Recommend? I mean, I have like all of my favorite products. If you go to ketomaria.com and if you scroll down to the shopping guide, that's where I've worked with a lot of companies to get coupon codes for everybody. So uh -huh. if you go there, there's coupon codes for all the supplements that I love. Um, all the different food products that I love that I believe are safe. I'm very, so, you know, bloggers, mm -hmm. they usually have advertising all over or pop-up ads. Yes. I hate those. <laughs> I know. I get offered, I'm talking thousands of dollars a month because I get so many hits on my website okay. and I turn that down because it's always quest chips or like crap. I would never recommend eating. Right. And so I was like, no, instead, I'm going to provide a shopping guide of things that are truly healthy and truly going to fuel your body well. There's no Atkins bars or any of that junk. But there are like some, there's some chocolates made from stevia and that type of stuff. And I worked with the company to get like a coupon so everybody can, everybody can eat good food and have success. Awesome. I love it. Very cool. Okay, great. And this kind of rolls into something else I wanted to touch with, um, and that's hormonal balance and getting into a place where your body is very, you know, healthy, vibrant, you have tons of energy. Um, I mean, just look, you know, seeing you uh, here as we're talking, I can tell you have tons of energy, but you, you mentioned how early you get up and your style of eating and that you don't do any coffee. So uh, how does that fit in as a next step in a person's keto journey? I am to bed very early. So let's just get that clear. But I'm just working with people a lot in Europe, so I have to ha have a different time change. But um, when it comes to hormonal balance, like animal protein is key. Like cholesterol makes healthy hormones. So this is why, like, and I think it's like, it's a massive amount, like 70% of men are suffering with testosterone issues. Mm -hmm. And the best way to increase that is to get some cholesterol. And that's, you know, the animal protein. Don't be afraid of the eggs and the red meat and the lobster and the whatever. But, the, you know, the cholesterol is really important for making, it makes healthy hormones. To my point, um, when like a woman goes through menopause, her cholesterol usually goes sky high. And to a medical doctor, they're like, oh, you need a statin drug. Right. But what's happening is the ovaries are no longer putting out estrogen and progesterone. And so the cholesterol goes up to try to get them to talk again, which they're not going to at a certain point of age. Mm -hmm. But the cholesterol remains elevated to help make healthy hormones, but it's not going to. So just realizing, and this is another fact, whenever I work with a man who's taking Viagra, he also, or I should say, whenever I'm working with a man that's taking a like a statin drug to lower cholesterol, he's also taking Viagra mm. yeah. because he's just suffering with hormones. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's so interesting, you know, these things, you know, serendipitous information. I just was working with a client last week who's, you know, just, just gone through menopause and she went to her nurse practitioner had high cholesterol and was told you have to get on statin. She comes to me all worried and like, what am I going to do? And I'm going to like have her listen to what we, we just talked about here um, yeah. because you explain it so well. Yeah. yeah. A calcium score will show like if there's any buildup in the arteries of like a plaque buildup. So yeah, yeah, exactly. So, okay, great. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. And I've also, um, you know, heard and recommended to people that, they eat more cholesterol rich foods to help give their body a rest from having to produce as much cholesterol all the time. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, hundred percent. If you don't eat enough cholesterol, your liver has to make it because you need it. And over time your liver gets tired 
So yeah, give your body a break for sure. All right, which totally goes against the myth of don't eat your egg yolks. So, okay, great. And then um, when a person is trying to balance their hormones and, you know, get those into a good space um, and, and live this lifestyle, I find a lot of times that the mental health piece comes in and people want to improve their mood in life and the, the hormone in, influence on that is obviously key. What are your thoughts on using keto specifically and, and how would it be different than using it for, um, you know, for weight loss, using it for improving a person's uh, mental and emotional stability in life? Well, I work with a, um, a lot. I mean, my whole bio is talking about my specialty is neurotransmitters. Right. And when you look at where serotonin and GABA and acetylcholine, like they're all like, they come from the gut. So healing the gut is step number one to healing anybody with depression, anxiety, but also like I work with a lot of women with anxiety. Low progesterone is the leading cause of anxiety. So looking at like progesterone and that type of stuff, you know, a low thyroid can cause depression. There's a whole bunch of things that can cause depression. I wrote a whole article on my website about it. High histamines, um, you know, gluten, because the, the protein in the gluten kind of has a cellular mimicry to that looks like serotonin. And it, you know, getting rid of the gluten, sometimes the dairy, a lot of times the dairy, you know, and a lot of times we reach towards alcohol. We know alcohol is depressant, right. um, but all these different things that can cause depression that we often grab towards, but healing the gut is really step number one and healing the gut by getting rid of the fiber, getting, um, you know, there's different supplements that can start healing the gut, but you're really getting rid of the gluten and those toxic foods. Nice. Makes sense. And then if a person was working on uh, healing their gut as the priority, would that change? Like, should they eat more fat, less fat, uh, higher protein, or, you know, does that change? You know, um, a lot of those supplements that heal the gut, they're amino acids that come from protein. So focusing on protein, but, you know, really getting rid of the sugar is important. Um, the carbohydrates, you know, to lower that inflammation, um, the grains, getting rid of the grains to lower the inflammation. Um, yeah, just if they are a lean, you know, if they don't have insulin resistance or di type two diabetes, I would, you know, the macros would just change. It just depends on what the body's at right at that moment. Makes sense. Makes sense. I know glutamine is one that's used a lot for healing the body and the gut and whatnot. Yeah. So that would be, would, yeah. What's yeah. that? I just wouldn't use it if someone has cancer or something like that for sure. Yeah. I got it. Everything's tailored. Yeah, for yeah. sure. Makes a lot of sense. Okay, great. And then um, as a person is, you know, getting through all their, uh, you know, they've done keto for a while and they really want to, uh, you know, take it to the next level. Um, what are some things to make this an enjoyable lifestyle that you, you would recommend to someone? Um, I mean... I, I think I don't feel like left out at all with what I eat. I feel, um, you know, just if you don't like to cook, um, I would say get a slow cooker and instant pot cause it does it for you. But you know, like if you don't want to buy one of my books, that's okay. Go to the library, but seriously, like there's really good food in there mm -hmm. and it does like, it is sustainable. It, it can be delicious and nothing like, I was on a television show. I was the, the chef and nutritionist. And one of the dudes on the show said, Maria, I came on the, cause he was a participant that really needed to reverse insulin resistance. And he's like, Maria, I came on the show kind of be like, yeah, I'll do the show, but I'm not going to live this way. And he's like, your food makes me know I can do this. Nice. And that's my whole purpose is showing people there's little ingredients by adding some fish sauce or, you know, whatever these ingredients that help like make your food pop and taste like restaurant quality. Mm -hmm. And you're going to save money by eating it at home. You're going to feel better by eating it at home um, than at a restaurant. And, you know, that's what I want to do is like, so if you don't want to buy one, go to the library, check it out, you know, because most like if they don't have them, tell them to get them because 
that's a win-win for me and for you. Of course, yeah. And I would definitely recommend to anyone to get your uh, your cookbooks. I know we have our favorites tabbed and we'll do a little prep on the weekend and it works really well. And you have some pretty nice food for the whole week. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then a lot of people, you know, they get their health under control and a lot of things are going better and they're looking at having, uh, you know, a kid and they want to improve their fertility. Are there any things that you would recommend people add to their ketogenic lifestyle to improve fertility? Um, it depends on what their, if they actually have some fertility issues, if it's something like PCOS or something like low testosterone in the male, it's definitely we want to, or for PCOS, you want to shrink the fat cells to start reversing that insulin resistance that's going on, mm -hmm. right? But if it's something that, like maybe they are too lean and they have low progesterone, and in that case, you definitely want to increase the fat. F eat foods filled with cholesterol, because cholesterol is going to make healthy hormones. That's that, and eat organ meats. When you look at our ancestral. Um, history, when someone was fertile, they put them in a hut and gave them all the organ meats. You know, they would kill the goat and, you know, give them the organ meats, but yeah. nobody likes the organ meats anymore. So like they make capsules or whatever for that. I personally only like a few organs like that. I would really like love them. Mm -hmm. um, but organ meat is the most nutrient dense food. So if you don't want to eat it, get the capsules. Um, but yeah, focus on foods high in cholesterol for sure. Awesome. Awesome. And I've heard it said that you should always have um, your organ meats and these foods high in, you know, nutrients and whatnot with fats that complement them as well. Well, food always has fat in it. So like even it's not that the organ meat alone has fat in it. So it's not mm. like it wouldn't be a fat free food. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's not like you have to add butter to the to the liver. Right. You know, it's just there. So makes yeah. sense. Built in. Yeah. Awesome. Um, okay, great. Well, thank you so much. Those are the topics that I had wanted to cover today. Um, oh. Was there anything else you wanted to bring up? I always like to ask. Um, you know, like I'm all about, like I told you, I say yes to everything when you ask me, yeah. but like, I would just say like, say yes to coming on a trip with me because that's probably like, I, the, my favorite way of teaching is like going to Italy and, you know, just seeing the most beautiful places in the world and whether like I've taken many of people on these trips, we just got back from Greece and half the people never did keto in their life, but they were interested in learning and they had, they ate whatever they wanted on the trip. But now like they're keeping in contact with me and they're like, Maria, I'm really having great success. And so I just want people to know, oh, I don't want to go on a trip and I can't have like limoncello or something or wine. You can do whatever you want. I'm not a judgy person, but I want to teach you my tricks. So come on a trip with me because it's amazing. Sounds great. That's that definitely sounds like a great uh, invitation that everyone Ryan, should take up. Ryan, come. <laughs> All right. Uh, great. So if someone were wanting to get a hold of you um, and they didn't know about all the amazing social media you have, website, etc. What's the best way for them to reach out and or get more information about what you do? Well, thank you, Ryan. Um, if you go to ketomaria.com, you can scroll all the way down to the bottom. You can find my private Facebook groups. Those are free support. You can find my Instagram account. You can find my YouTube channel. I also have a YouTube channel for Paddle boarding with the humpback whales. So oh, it's nice. not even nutrition based. Um, but um, on Keto Maria, you can find my blog, which has all thousands and thousands. I've been blogging since blogging just came out. So, and there's no recipe pop up ads. So you can find all those recipes, uh, the link on Keto Maria if you scroll down. Otherwise, on the other side, there's the support. So if you want my one on one support, you can find that too. But you could also find the trips on Keto Maria. So, oh, good. Yes, we got to find those. For sure. It's the best way to learn. <laughs> Absolutely. Sounds amazing. Great. Well, thank you so much for being here with us today, Maria. Thank you, Ryan. You are awesome. Thanks. You too.